Well, welcome everybody. Um, I'm very excited to bring you this program um, in collaboration with the Berwick Community TV and the Berwick Public Library. We have a special guest tonight, Dr. Warren Reese. Dr. Reese is a research associate professor emeritus of history at the University of Maine. During the past 40 years, his research and teaching have focused on maritime archeology span in history of the Americas. He is internationally known as a principal investigator of archeological investigation of an 18th century British merchantman discovered in Manhattan. For his archeological work on the Revolutionary War Penobscot expedition, his articles and book on the 17th century English galleon, Angel Gabriel, and his investigation of the ship found in 2010 at the World Trade Center. And that's what we're gonna be talking about tonight. So welcome Dr. Reese and please uh, take it away. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak to all of you this evening. Uh, some of you may remember back in 1982, uh, probably a few of you, uh, that uh, we excavated a ship in Manhattan. Now, the, uh, this evening, I'm gonna give you an, an overview of the project, and then I'll focus on, on the ship's construction and design uh, for the few of you who may or may not, uh, or who may uh, be interested in that. The, um, let me give you a quick overview of Manhattan uh, and, and shipping. So 16th century, the uh, Europeans explored America and the Dutch uh, located the Hudson River and the island of Manhattan. Um, but unfortunately for them, it didn't lead to Asia. And the Dutch uh, started uh, exploring in that area, decided they would do uh, some trading with the, the local Indians, and then um, decided, well, maybe they ought to set up a trading post. And so they were looking around in the early 1600s. And in 1613, one of the uh, Dutch Adrian Block on a ship called Tiger uh, was going uh, up the Hudson River and Tiger caught fire and they had to abandon it on the island of Manhattan. Uh, this image shows the original island, the lower part of it, and the part that was filled. The, the Dutch started filling out over the mudflats. Uh, Manhattan was originally surrounded by mudflats at low tide and shallow water. But in order to get, you know, so to get goods in and out and people in and out off the island, they had to put them in small boats and row them in and go over the mud, et cetera. So they started filling in out into the river on both sides. And uh, what you're seeing here is a 1909 map showing where the fill was in 1909. And we see all those piers, most of those are now land. So that was filled in also in the 20th century. But, um, and then the English took the island in 1660s from the Dutch, called it uh, New York, and they continued filling out. So in 1916, at what's now uh, the intersection of uh, Greenwich and Day Streets, they, they were digging a tunnel for the subway and they found some timbers and they thought it might be from Tiger. Old timbers, charred, about eight and a half feet of uh, charred keel and three frames, not much. And so uh, the timbers were taken and roughly conserved. They are in the New York City Museum. And uh, they're probably not the tiger. They're, they're uh, a little more modern than that, probably colonial local built. Then in uh, 1978, the 
at the South Street Seaport Museum, which is just south of the Brooklyn Bridge, they were doing some hand excavation underneath one of the buildings there to put in some new plumbing, I believe. And they ran into some chip timbers, but they couldn't do, so an archeologist did some quick uh, il illustrations of what was there without digging down. They couldn't dig down because the building might collapse. So that was about all they got to see of that. And then you have the World Trade Center uh, vessel in, in uh, 2010. Now this is after the World Trade Center towers collapsed. And this is just south of the Southern Tower. They uh, were excavating down deeper than they had before into what had been 13 feet of water during the colonial period. And uh, a lot of people don't realize that the, the Twin Towers and everything around it were actually part of the Hudson River originally, it's all fill. Anyway, they found a vessel and the bottom timbers of a vessel. And I was called in to uh, be the principal investigator for that. Kathleen was my wife and Carrie Atkins and I worked with the AKRF, the local archeologists. And we were given five days to excavate, record and move the timbers, which we did. That's another story. Oh. So those are three of the four vessels that were found. But tonight I'm gonna to talk about the one from 1982, um, which is the largest uh, remains that we found and the one that we've been able to study most completely. So about a block and a half in from the East River, which is, let's see, right about here. Can you see that? Uh, yeah, okay. Um, the, they were, there had been a, um, a parking lot there and a developer named Ronson bought that one acre of parking lot for $10 million, by the way, in 1980. Uh, and uh, was gonna uh, develop it, it put a 30 story office building there but he was required to do archeological study. So the archeologists, land archeologists were in there studying backyards and buildings and, and all kinds of things. And in one little area uh, to see if the stratigraphy was the same as the other part, they uh, had a backhoe dig a big hole, went down and there were some ship timbers. They were looking at the side of a ship. So I got called in to take a look. Now, one of the things that, uh, was serendipitous was I was in graduate school at the University of New Hampshire at the time. I'd gone through my exams for my PhD and uh, I just finished a one semester study of the merchant trade and their sh ships and their shipping, um, how it all worked in the 18th century. I just, I don't know how it just was interesting to me. And one of the things that stuck in my head was that the economic historians, a uh, number of them, had been quite fascinated with the development of the British Empire. Now, the, uh, the British Empire was spreading out. It was a young empire, it was tertiary. It wasn't the first place big empire that we think of in the early part of the 18th century. So around 1700, the French, the Germans, the Dutch were way ahead of the Portuguese and the Spanish, way ahead of the British. And, uh, but the British grew rapidly so that by the end of the century, they were number one. And they were trying to figure this out. What, you know, what made it, the British empire so great? How did it do that? And so they looked at various things. Well, one of the things the British wiped out the pirates, or they just, a Navy just went after the pirates and, and that cut down um, the cost of shipping a lot. Um, and they started warehousing, which the Portuguese had been doing, and they started doing it too. They uh, did a number of things, and, and there's a whole list of things. But when they added everything, when these economic historians added everything up, it didn't add up. Even synergistically, it didn't add up to what the British had done. And what they had done was between 1713 and 1754, which isn't a very long time period, couple of generations, they dropped the cost of shipping goods across the ocean in half. And when you think about it, that's pretty amazing. And 
they, in those days, things weren't changing so rapidly as they are now. And that allowed them to ship goods, raw material, people quickly, military quickly and efficiently. And that allowed the empire to grow. So why, if all these things were going on? And one guy in one sentence said, you know, I wonder if they made the ships more efficient. And uh, we're never going to know until somebody finds one. I, I finished that, wrote it all up as a report to my mentor in December of 1981. And two months later, I was down in New York. I went, a backhoe took me down like a little elevator into that hole. I looked at the side of an 18th century merchant ship. And I did some measurements and we probably had a British merchant ship from the 18th century. I was like, I looked around, <laughs> a movie or something, <laughs> you know? Um, so uh, there we had it. And I realized this was going to be very important. So um, I guess I was supposed to be showing this slide when I was talking all about that. The I, one thing to think about with these merchant ships, if you, Think of this empire growing. They're like the red blood cells of, of an adolescent's body. You know, if they, if they all of a sudden become twice as efficient, carrying oxygen and taking away bad stuff, that body is going to be more healthy. It's going to grow faster, et cetera. And that's what the English, the British had done. So here we are. We're uh, back to 175 Water Street. And... Uh, I, uh, the developers, the, the archaeologists who were doing the rest of the site, were going to be leaving um, at the end of uh, January. And so, and it was snowing. It was a really, well, you know, what winters are like. Uh, and in, if you've been in New York in, in winters, in some ways it's worse than here because it's cold and damp and you got a wicked wind going all the time. So, uh, the crew was uh, pretty tired there, and I was asked to put together a proposal to, to excavate this ship and get it the hell out of the way of the developer, but to do it right. So I thought, okay. Um, I, I looked a little bit into it. The interest that the developer was paying for that $10 million was $10,000 a day. Um, in 1982 money. And I found that uh, because of construction contracts, if we went into the month of March, it was going to cost him about $50,000 a day. So $10,000 a day in February, $50,000 a day in March. I said, okay, we got to hurry this up then. It's got to do this whole ship in one month. Now, as a grad student, you know, and all I knew is archaeology takes a long time. You do it very carefully, and you have no money. You never archaeologists never have money. You know, it just you, you never get. You know, you put in for a grant for ten thousand dollars, you get two, and you do what you can with volunteers and whatever. Here we had a month, so I uh, I put together this plan with Shelley and I, Shelley, with my ex-wife and I, um, we put this together. And I presented it uh, to uh, the powers to be in the city and the developer and the state archaeologists and everything. And uh, I said, we're going to need 48 archaeologists and we're going to need uh, three pumps to keep the water level out. And we're going to do this, 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 this. And we'll be out March 1st. And so I kind of looked at the developer and he said, okay. You've got it. Um, just don't come to me on March 1st and say you need another day. Okay. So when everybody left, he came over and he said, look, um, I, I'm serious about that, about March 1st. And, and he said, you get what you need. You said you needed three pumps. I want you to get five pumps and a union pump operator. You know, get, you want the 48 archeologists, that's fine. I noticed they weren't wearing helmets down there. Buy them all their own helmets. Buy them all foul weather gear. Do whatever you need. Just get out. And I said, well, I have a budget worked up. See, you don't have a budget. You can't spend enough money to get this. You know, Just get it done. We'll go over the records later. Okay. 
uh, completely opposite of everything I had done before. So this is most of the crew. Uh, we gathered up for a photograph just before we started. Actually, I think we were just gathering up. We hadn't really set up yet. And we started excavating. And we're going down by hand. Uh, we're looking down at the lower deck. This is above the cargo hold of the ship. So the ship was extant from about five feet above this, the water level all the way down to the bottom, the whole length of the ship. The only problem we had is that part of the ship was under the street. So lengthwise, a bit oblique, but um, so we couldn't get it. We, we got to see about half of the ship, but it's the whole port side. We're looking aft here, which is south. It was pointing north. Um, and this is all excavation by hand. We went down shovels, trowels. Uh, we didn't use brushes, we used uh, uh, garden hoses. And uh, down we went. One of the problems that archaeologists have <laughs> is our ethics. Uh, and we accept that, that's what it is. It's very different from other sciences. I started off in physics. Um, and uh, and then I worked in physical ke uh, chemical oceanography um, before I went back to grad school, became an archaeologist and an historian. But the archaeology is different from other sciences because it cannot be repeated. If I'm doing a, a physics experiment or even designing a rocket to go to Mars, um, we experiment. You know, rockets blow up and that. We do a lot of that things and go back and forth. If I'm a biologist, I can if I'm a chemist and I discover something and I die before I write it up, no problem. There are other chemists who can do that. Archaeology gets looked, the site gets looked at once. As we go down, we destroy everything, right? Take it all apart, destroy the orientation of everything. And so um, we have to make sure, one, that we're recording everything. Two, that we know what questions to ask the site so that we're looking for specific answers. It, you can't just go in there and say, okay, I've recorded everything and go home. It's kind of like a detective, you know, you can't walk in and take pictures of a room and stuff and go home and then say, well, you know, did you find out who murdered? It? Oh, was I supposed to look for murderers? You know, evidence of a murder? Oh, that would have been different, you know? You gotta know those questions ahead of time You've got to do everything well. And the thing is, as I tell my students, if you excavate a site and you don't publish that site, it's not that you're not going to get promoted in a university. You destroy the site for no reason at all, except your own ego, because the information has to get out there. Um, nobody else got to look at it. And so I tell them, you're going straight to hell. You don't get to see St. Peter. That's it. So, okay. So that's the background of what I was dealing with. And again, grad student. So, you know, I didn't have the experience to balance on just trying to think all these things, as were the other people involved. This is now looking forward. So we're on the south end of it, looking forward. Um, the bow is up in here and then coming back to the stern, which is right about there, or right here. So, and these tarps are there because again, we're in February. We had one day of sun. Everything else was either freezing rain, uh, extremely cloudy with the wind coming off or snowstorms. And so we had tarps we could put over if it was really bad, trying to work through. We only had two snow days where we just couldn't do it and people couldn't get into the city. And we went, now with the recording that we did was it, we had that, uh, let me back up here, had the ship in to five sections. And those had to do with the locks. You see these walls, those were walls actually of um, 19th century buildings that were built up over the ship. And interestingly, you know how, uh, and the wall comes down when you build a, a build, building with, or a house, um, you have concrete wall goes down and then you have what's called a, a, a footer or a spread footer, uh, which spreads the weight out, okay? 
They didn't do that with this, with those buildings. These were three-story buildings. They used the the uh, deck beams of the ship to take the weight, the old oak deck beams. Anyway, uh, we had one, two, this, there had been a wall that collapsed on us. Uh, the safety engineers demanded that we keep these walls thinking they were holding the ship up. Actually, the ship was holding these walls up and uh, one collapsed in here, which was good for us. It didn't hit anybody and we could go in and, and study. That's the cargo hold. So we had these five areas. So we had five um, teams uh, excavating and recording. This, this is up in the bow. And I I'm, was a Boy Scout. And, um, one of the things you learn is be prepared, right? And so whenever I do a project, I have contingency plans. What if this? What if that? Um, it, 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 nothing happens the way you plan it to. But by having two or three contingency plans, you have enough thought ahead of time to figure things out. And one of them was, what if we get to save the bow? Wouldn't that be cool? You know, nobody had seen this sort of vessel before. And uh, so I had a plan for that. And um, actually, I say I. I'm saying a lot of I, but this is all teamwork. So I should say we. Um, and we developed this plan a couple of weeks before the end. And about a week before the end, the city of New York said, can you save the bow for us? Said, okay. So the plan was this, we take it apart piece by piece and take it out. And that comes from learning from people before us, our, our instructors, our professors, who had learned that in underwater archeology, span which I cut my teeth on, um, you don't take the you don't cut off the bow and take it up. That's expensive, time consuming, and you don't get to conserve the piece as well. If you take it apart after labeling it and recording it, you can hand each piece up. It could be taken with a, a backhoe acting as a crane, taken over to where it needs to go, put in a pool of water. Each piece can in the lab can be cleaned, studied all the facets of it, conserved better. And then you just put it back together, as opposed to if anybody been in the Vas at the Vasa in Sweden, you see this wonderful ship, 1960, they brought it up. They didn't know better. They did a great job for what they were doing. They kept it together and they're still trying to conserve it. If they'd taken it apart, they're the ones that told everybody else, whatever you do, don't do what we did. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, nothing wrong with what they did at the time. Um, but if you take it apart, you can conserve everything in, in three or four years as opposed to many decades. Anyway, so that's what we did. Um, and we recorded it all uh, with uh, waterproof notebooks. You'll see the uh, carriers using that and mapping it uh, down here. He's taking measurements over here. And we had a still photographer who took hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of photographs. So. Here we are in the cargo hold, not the fill. What we have are the layers of, in this case, some beach stone. And then this is coral. And there's brain coral mixed in with other coral in here. Then we have uh, black volcanic sand and flint. So this is what we're seeing is um, excess ballast from other vessels. They'd come in to New York with uh, goods from the Caribbean or from England. And uh, because they were bringing in manufactured goods, uh, that didn't fill the ship. And so they had to have extra weight. So they'd have some ballast to get rid of. And you don't just dump it in the harbor because pretty soon you're filling the harbor in the wrong place. So you ask the harbor master or the, uh, often they had a ballast master, where to go and they say, oh, they're trying to fill that old ship over there, go fill it up. And what we realized uh, was that the ship had been brought in as part of the fill process. And uh, as we excavated down farther on the outside, we saw that it was actually spiked to some piling. So the ship had been stripped and then brought in at high tide, spiked to some pilings and used as cribbing for the fill. And eventually it became the outer key for a few years and then more fill went out farther, another block and a half into the river. And slowly it was filled up with 
mostly ballast from other ship. The top, the top layer uh, is dirt and garbage and stuff like that from um, the 19th century New York. So we're looking forward in the cargo hold here. And that, uh, for those of you into ship construction, you're looking at the inner planking or seal, it's called ceiling planking. And then here we're looking aft at the same area, just looking the other way. And we've taken off the um, ceiling planking and cleaned out in between the frames. And so you see the framing. And again, for those of you who are into it, this is the um, what's called the master frame or the midship frame on, and the warships that would be a triple uh, thickness. And, uh, but in this ship, it was just double like the other frames. I, and during the question period, I'd be happy to answer any technical questions you have. I just don't want to put other people to sleep right now. The, uh, and here we are taking the bow apart. Now, one of the wonderful things is I was doing the strapping. I had been, I was in the main National Guard. I was trained to be a, a, a what's called, a, they called a pioneer. Uh, combat engineer, most call, people say a sapper. Um, so I know how to do a lot of construction things uh, by hand. And uh, I was doing that. And then the backhoe was, was picking up the timbers. And uh, one of the crew, Abby Jaroslow, came over and she said, Warren, can I help you? And I said, well, yeah, what do you want to do, Abby? She said, well, I was a, a union rigger in construction for two summers when I was in college. Um, and I noticed you're not using the right signals to the crane operator. <laughs> okay, go for it, Abby. And man, was she awesome because they knew every, she would use her little finger one way, you know, just a little twitch and they understood completely what she was saying. And she would strap things up and they would get them out of there beautifully. Uh, nothing was bumped or anything. So she was the hero of the last three days of, of the excavation. Well, when we were done, a large excavator just tore out the rest of the ship. Um, there was nobody wanted the timbers of the rest of the ship, um, which is sad, you know, from our point of view, but we understood it would cost in those days probably a million dollars to conserve it. And then it would have to have a huge building to, you know, kind of uh, humidity and temperature control for the rest of eternity. And not too many people wanted to do that. Um, as someone, the safety guy I was talking to said, I said, I'm having trouble understanding why with all this money, New, York, New Yorkers won't want to do that. He said, well, the people who have the money are not, they don't live in New York. They come into New York and they think of the future. They don't care about the past. He said, me, I'm a safety guy. I think of the present. I'm watching you guys to make sure you do everything right. So you look, he said, you guys think of the past. He said, well, all of us are needed. And I thought, eh, this guy's a philosopher, but he was right. And uh, so anyway, that was all torn apart. We were exhausted. We worked uh, 32 days actually um, straight um, sleeping, six, seven hours a night. And otherwise we were working, whether we were sleeping or showering or whatever, we were all talking, trying to get things squared away, um, right straight through. So Shelly and I, we had co-directed this, by the way, um, uh, during the field part, then she went off to other things. But, um, so we went home for the weekend. We left all of our personal foul weather gear there and the master notebooks books and, and that sort of thing all in the lab. We returned uh, to New York on Monday to clean up the uh, artifact lab. And they had cleaned it for us. And they had thrown away all the boxes of trash and the personal belongings of us. And that included all of our notebooks and the key datum locations and significant oh, sketches. The overall measurements were all gone. They were all on somewhere New York trash. And uh, the only thing we had were the photographs, which were being processed, and uh, those small uh, 
notebooks, one for each uh, section, which of the five sections. We didn't have anything for the overall anything. Didn't even know the length of the ship because that well, you know, we took that right off. But who remembered? We had so much, so many things. Um, and I thought, well, you know, I was a physics major. I had many years of algebra, geometry, trigonometry. I had sixteen credits of calculus. Um, my, you know, I could figure this out. I could put it all together. Duh. And uh, so, as I said, Shelley went off to other things that she had started before this, some other projects for, for her studies. And I thought, well, I'll work on this. I can get this done. Because I didn't, I wanted to see St. Peter. I didn't want to go straight to hell. Well, all right. So as I started putting things together, um, I realized that this is pretty much what the ship looked like, only a little smaller. This was a British merchant ship from... 1717 in New York. Now, this illustration is an engraving, a large one. This is a small part of it. And it wasn't showing particular ships. It was showing one of all the kinds of vessels that came into the harbor. That was the purpose of it. And so you see this as, as the merchant ship. It has uh, three gun ports here. And well, two gun ports anyway, this could be a loading port here. And this is definitely a loading port. Um, but as I said, it's, it's, it's larger than, than our vessel, but probably if you put, you know, um, went down about 80%, you probably have the best. So I thought, well, okay, how do I figure out what ship this is? Because it's one thing to say, we've got a ship and this is what it looked like, et cetera. But, It'd be a lot better if we can name it and then we can follow its history and that could we could put everything together right i say we at this point it was me so the team had dispersed after the field work and and i was doing this so off to chancery lane in england to look at the records there and uh, what i realized was i was going to have to use various approaches and put them together synergistically. So uh, what I did was I did historical research at the same time, um, uh, got somebody to do the botanical research, which was looking at the wood and trying to get an exact species of some of the wood um, because it, it was pretty degraded, looked like we had some oak and some pine and some cedar. And that was about all I could tell really. The, the grain of the oak looked like southern live oak, uh, which is very, live oak's a very particular kind of oak, um, but we couldn't be sure. And then the uh, biology, the zoology, if you will, of uh, the teredo worms and um, other mollusks that we found on the outside of the vessel, and also the shape, the morphology of it. So I was going to approach it, I, and I thought this through, these four ways and they would feed into each other as, as time went on. So historical records, the Naval Office shipping, which, which would, had nothing to do with the Navy, it was a misnomer using modern English, uh, but it was a clerk who, um, in, in each of the ports of the British Empire, and he would write, he would write down as every ship came in, with all kinds of information about it, and when it left, all kinds of information about it. And then four times a year, those records would be sent off to England and uh, they would go into the rec records office of the, the, the Naval office and um, clerks there would have that from all the different ports in the empire and they'd make sure that the ships were following the rules. So they could say, oh, this ship said it's going to London. Did it show up in London? Oh yes, it came into London and then went to Barcelona. Okay, we don't have somebody in Barcelona, but we see it coming from Barcelona and going to Virginia. Okay, that's good, you know, that sort of thing was going on. Also colonial and British newspapers, uh, there are very few. Uh, and, and a lot of the, the Naval Office shipping lists, those clerks list, um, didn't exist anymore. Uh, the uh, British in the late 18 um, hundreds, they needed more space in the archives. So they pulled things that nobody had looked at, just burned them. And nobody cares, you know. So a lot of that disappeared. And then there was an odd sort of thing, the six 
it's even sixpence less. And this is every ship that came into London. They paid sixpence per sailor aboard. And that went to support the hospital for um, retired seamen. And uh, so uh, bits and pieces from newspapers, various things, I uh, try to put together the history uh, and look for ships that were about the right size that might have ended up in New York, that might have been built with these kinds of woods, that might have had that same number of gun ports that we found, which was four, and uh, do that. So then on the zoology, um, there were shipworms on the outside. And, and um, by luck, I happened to know a woman at Harvard who was the world's expert. She wrote the books on shipworms. People around the world used her books um, to determine, to identify. Well, you think, well, the worms are long gone. They're really mollusks. And they had, uh, there were uh, one shell that they dig into the wood of the old ships. And uh, those shells would be left behind. And so I sent her some samples of the wood and she identified it as, as three particular shipworms from the shells that they left. And uh, none of them were from the, uh, North America, interestingly enough. Um, back to the records. Okay, so we've got shipworms that say you've got it. Oh, the other thing about shipworms is, uh, and I knew this from her before, the, um, they have these sex orgies in the port. <laughs> Basically, when one shipworms, tornadoes, a, a certain kind of shipworms, um, when one of them decides to have sex, and then it gives off certain hormones, and then all of them throughout the, the port or the harbor or the cove, wherever, decide to have it at the same time. So the then the waters are filled with spawn was about four or five days later. And those go out and they settle as little babies into dead wood ships. Uh, and then they grow in there. So um, what I, and this only happens in warm water. So I was looking for a ship that could pick up these particular shipworms uh, all at once somewhere. And um, I'll try not to go in a long part of this, a whole chapter of the book, I think. <laughs> and, 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 was the right size, was in the port records, might have been in the newspaper, try, oh, try to put all this together. And uh, went back to the port records, tried to figure out what was going on. And it all led, this is the end of the book actually, so if you don't want to spoil it alert here, uh, to Charleston and the Carolinas, which was a small town, it was Charlestown at the time. Um, and, uh, in 1717, they built a large ship. Uh, it was the largest ship that was had been built or would be built for another 30 years. And they called it Princess Carolina. And it was exactly the size of our ship. Um, I followed the records around and where she had been and as best I could, picked it a little up here, picked a little up there. And uh, she could have easily, in fact, she was one of only five ships in all the colonial period, all the, the 19th, 18th century that I could find that had been in the right ports to pick up those Dorados. And uh, everything pointed to this ship. Princess Carolina, why Carolina? Sounds like, well, she's from uh, the Carolinas, but also at the time, Princess Caroline who was called Carolina because her mother was also Princess Caroline. <laughs> Not a long story, but uh, she was the darling of uh, Britain. Everybody loved her mother and therefore a little girl, uh, Princess Carolina. And uh, there was some, a lot of politics at the time. And so it was a good name for the ship at the time. Well, <clears throat> this is, Princess Carolina's world. Um, she made she made two shuttle trips to London and back to Charleston. London back to Charleston. She was owned by 
uh, people from Charleston, the merchants, and uh, they were having trouble because they were there was an Indian war there. There were pirates off the coast. Um, Blackbeard was attacking people off the coast there at the, at that very time, and they couldn't get British or New England merchant ships to come there. And they had a settlement. They were the southernmost British British settlement. Uh, and the next place was St. Augustine, which was Spanish, and the Spanish and the French were attacking them, and the Indians were attacking them from the West. Um, they needed to make their own ship that could go back and forth to London, so they did. And uh, so the ship made two trips, and then the principal owner of Princess Carolina changed to a uh, merchant agent. It was an agent in London who uh, then sent her on various trips, including to um, Lisbon in Portugal and to uh, Barcelona, which is over here in Spain, um, was also show up in, um, well, there's Lisbon. Uh, that was before the, the, if you know about the earthquake and fire, this was all before that. <clears throat> and the records, the port records were destroyed in the, in the fire, but the ship also stopped in Madeira and um, picked that up in, in the Portuguese records in Lisbon. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you, by the way, <clears throat> if you really want to <laughs> challenge yourself, try reading early 18th century English records are tough enough um, because basically these port clerks, each one used different abbreviations and different handwritings and they made their letters differently. They actually different shapes for different letters. If you go to a foreign country, uh, you know, this is in Portuguese and his abbreviations, you know, you've got to know the language to understand what this is. I do not. So I, I had to depend on some very good translators who really understood early 18th century, um, not only Portuguese, but the script that, that some of the clerks were using. As far as I know, there are two people in the world that can do that. <laughs> and uh, so here in Madeira, it was, a, it was a, out in the middle of the ocean and a lot of European ships stopped there to revittle. Uh, so there was settlements in, in Madeira, uh, Portuguese and English mix, and they produced a lot of food stuff, a lot of fruit, and of course, wine. And, uh, and in fact, throughout the colonial period, the uh, most, most of the wine that the colonists in North America had were, was from Madeira. So eventually I put together this uh, itinerary of, of Princess Carolina. And uh, yeah, let's see, this would show you, but I'm gonna skim over this. This was uh, looking at the different Virginia planters that were, she was carrying tobacco back and forth. Well, 20 years of frustration. I had a hard time, I had the history of the ship. I, quite certain I had the right ship, everything fit. And I thought, well, okay, now I've got to show how the ship was constructed. And I kept trying to put it all together, all the different details. Um, I tried doing it on the computer. I had uh, a uh, intern spend two summers with me making models of each piece of the vessel, uh, one to 30 models, and then putting them together to see if my plans were correct. She was brilliant and uh, proved most of the stuff I had figured out was right, but she would find a mistake I had made, um, didn't fit, and she figured out what it should have been. And that's when she came to me. She never told me, oh, I think I'm having a, I'm not sure you did this right. She'd figure the whole thing out and then come to me and show me the solution, uh, you know, and I, I've been at this for a long time and she was like between her sophomore and junior year, she's a brilliant person. She's now a professor up in Canada. <laughs> anyway, I still, no matter what I did, 
the bow and the rest of the ship didn't quite fit. And it looked like, you know, all the people that worked there on the site were professional archaeologists that all had at least a master's degree and some had PhDs. Um, and they, I know they were doing everything as best they could, although they were tired. Um, it, it all didn't fit together still. And um, I was working backwards and it looked like the benchmarks that we were measuring from were actually moving around in three dimensions or something, something was weird. Eventually figured out, and actually this was uh, in a conversation with one of the guys who did a, a one to 10 model of the bow. We were chatting about it and I went for a walk and all of a sudden it hit me that the uh, ship was moving. Basically, as we were excavating down, the pressure from the water around it in the soil was pushing in. Now we let the, the ship fill with water every night, so it, it was freezing, you know, so we so it wouldn't freeze. We let it fill with water. And then in the morning we got the pumps going and got it down. And the farther we went down, of course, the, so the pressure is coming in. And these big old timbers were very slowly moving, evidently. And we didn't see that. And then they'd go back to their position after the was filled with water and then in the morning we'd start pumping and they would move. So as we measured at different days, things would be slightly different. So it's like we didn't notice it. But once I figured that out and worked it back, it was pretty obvious that everything worked out. You could see what was happening. So finally figured it all out. This is Terry, the one who did the models and um, brilliant kid. This is pretty much what the ship looked like. This right side, we never saw. That's what was under the street. The left side is what we had, some of the upper. Okay, so the ship was moving, breathing each day. Um, now, we knew, I knew how Austin created the ship, built the ship. But how did he design it? That really intrigued me because we knew how they designed warships, but nobody wrote down really how they did merchant ships. It was a secret. It was a secret for various reasons. One, they didn't want to lose their job by telling everybody how to do it. And two, uh, they were exempt from uh, military duty. And in fact, in American colonies, most of the colonies, it was illegal for a shipwright to be in the military, in the militia, because they were afraid that they get killed. It's just too valuable. They didn't want to lose these people. And you think about it, you know, th these ships were the technological marvel of any maritime society. So the very best people, people who might be rocket scientists or, you know, uh, computer chip engineers or whatever, our best uh, technical people, those people in those age were designing and building the ships. These were very bright people. Well, this is how they design warships, very complex um, geometry, straight geometry, but um, the center for the arcs, you see this, figuring this out for this arc, where's that point? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm pointing the wrong place here. You know, how, how does that point, how do you figure that out? Well, they're using complex, things like, you know, 930 seconds of the length of the keel times um, 550 seconds of the br maximum breadth. And then you put uh, this point here and that's the radius of that. And that's fine if you're gonna write it down. And now they wrote it down to warships because they had to go to the Admiralty and say, this is how I wanna design a ship. And we have these models that they made. They're all warships. They were for the government. And when we find those warships, we find that they wasted a lot of wood to make perfect squares and rectangles and arcs. They look perfect. I mean, even hundreds of years later, we look at it and go, yeah, this is a government ship. This is because they had to match that and they charged more for it. The merchant ships, all we know, we, we've seen some contracts. 
and they're like a paragraph long. Yes, I will build a 150 ton ship for you that can go across the Atlantic and you want the deck at such and such a height and you want the captain's quarters to be like this and you want this kind of sheathing on the outside because you're going to go into warm water and I'll have it to you by so and so and you're going to pay me so much a ton plus you're going to supply the hardware. That's it. Okay. So I'm curious, how did they do that? I worked, started working it backwards. So you get an arc here, draw a line that's perpendicular to the arc, see where the center of that circle lies. This is another one. Okay, that doesn't hit here, it hits here. Okay, so the guy used two arcs and some straight lines to make that particular frame. Eventually, it took a long time because I was looking, thinking it would be a lot more complex than it was. But of course, if it's going to be in people's minds and passed along from father to son or to nephew, it's got to be easy to memorize and to keep in your head. And what I found out eventually is that these, this guy used multiples of four feet in everything. So that the radius of that circle on the bottom was four feet. The, for this arc, it was a radius of 12 feet. Notice where the center is, right in the center line of the ship. And that continued throughout the ship using different multiples of four feet and where the center line was, I mean, the, the center of each arc was and how they matched up. I won't go into it here. I've got a book coming out for the very few people in the world who care uh, that takes a step by step and, and I, I show how each frame was designed. Amazingly simple. Ended up with a ship that obviously was successful. It had gone through storms and storms and more storms uh, for years across the Atlantic and held together. And uh, I could see the timing, made good time. Um, so, you know, it's, it's something new. We, it's something we didn't know before, how they designed these merchant ships. You might have the question, well, did this answer your question about more efficient ship? Yeah, this does design a fellow for his master's degree in mechanical engineering used modern computer software of stability and speed and all those things plug this in uh, this ship design in uh, for this particular ship and uh, found that it actually uh, sailed very very well and could sail with a simple um, set of sails simple rig uh, with fewer sailors than the um, than a faster sh ship, uh, more maneuverable ship would be. This had a fairly flat bottom. Um, I won't go into the details, but it was a lot more efficient than what the British had had just before that, from what we could see from the little illustrations. So I think that I don't know if this is the answer, but they definitely this one ship. <laughs> that's the problem. This one ship, it might have been an, an anomalous ship, or just one of a kind, or maybe this was one of two, three hundred uh, that were similarly built. This shipwright, by the way, came from a family of shipwrights in Scotland. So there's a good chance that he learned it uh, from them, from his family, and uh, that this is a type, but I, I wouldn't swear to that. Um, I, I don't know. Um, yeah. And if we've actually answered that question of this just happened to be a good ship that was made that way. So the ship, by the way, was last mentioned in a letter that uh, I was down in, in the Virginia archives and told the archivist what I was looking for. And she gave me some records and I was looking through them. And, she on her own went off and did some searching and found this letter um, from the Admiralty, or actually to the Admiralty by a British captain. And uh, he had been um, convoying or protecting a convoy of merchant ships, including Princess Carolina in 1729 across the Atlantic. 
and uh, they were in a terrible storm and uh, she was beaten up. They thought she was lost. And so when he got to London, he said, you know, that those two ships, you know, the, I can't remember the other one, the Francis and Princess Carolina uh, didn't show up the next day. So we assume it's lost. But what we found was that this ship had been beaten up pretty badly somehow. And it's four mast step is where the mast is, goes into a hole up in the bow, uh, had broken. And the somebody had jury rigged another hunk of wood over on top of that, just spiked it as best they could and put up a, it looks like they'd taken a spar because the, the, the new hole was smaller, just the size of the main spar. And uh, jury rigged a sail and, and limped back into New York for repairs. And she was an older vessel and they probably just condemned it and brought it in uh, for, uh, to be part of the film. And uh, that's where she be. So what's, what's happened to her? Um, we learned about uh, somewhat about how they, they filled in New York um, out into the rivers and why this vessel was a block and a half in from the current river, East River. Also, uh, you know, that all these studies brought it back to, to this one ship. And uh, learned how they built the ship, a lot of details of that, um, and, and how they designed it. And uh, all of this took about 30 years, my time, plus writing the book, uh, from discovery into through the interpretation. And that, that's when I finally felt confident to write a book. And I wrote it basically to educate the public. Uh, and, and hopefully uh, some people will read it. And I tried to put the reader on my shoulder as I went through this whole process in detail without letting them fall asleep. So um, I open it now to questions and uh, I'm gonna push the buttons and try to get out of the slideshow so that I can see you. And I think that works like that. Okay. Everybody's muted except me and Ron. Did I say something? I'm not muted. Please do. No it, question. This this is this is fascinating. Uh, all this the speculation that you had to go through to uh, come to your conclusions. It's yeah. <laughs> It's uh, one of the things I realized as I was putting the book together was that my 33-year-old daughter at the time had never known a minute when her father wasn't working on this project. Um, you know, I did other things to make a living, <laughs> but uh, um, this was always, well, I put it down, you know, once in a while, it get frustrated. Um, couldn't figure these things, especially that bit about the timbers moving. It just took forever to finally realize what was happening and then to check it by working it backwards to see that, yes, that's really what was happening. So do you feel relieved having the book or is it like a loss? Like now your mission is complete and your passion is, um, is completed now. So it must be like a, it's such a huge part of your life for so long, and now your book's out, and it must. I, I wonder how you feel. I'm relieved. <laughs> I'm relieved <laughs> because you know, as I said, you got to publish this thing. So uh, you know, I got to get that out to people. Um, that's the whole ethic in archaeology, and uh, uh, everything else is secondary. And this was such an important site. I, it was very frustrating at times um, uh, for long periods of time. And so finally, you know, I, and I'm not 100% sure it's Princess Carolina. It's just that the evidence, one of the things I did, by the way, uh, on that 
Paul, is uh, my wife's best friend is married to a guy who works for the National Academy of Science. He's one of the two guys there who looks at experiments and things like that for the federal government to see if the logic of the experiment makes sense. And he's like one of the world's experts at that, you know, in, in statistics and logic. And I said, you know, can you look at this, Mike, and tell me how close am I to this ship being the right ship? So he went through all my stuff, was very nice about it. And he got back and he said, I talked with the other guy too about this. And uh, we decided that there's almost no possibility it could be another ship. It's all your data and all everything you found. And you've looked at, you know, 97% of things and nothing else comes close. It's possible, but highly improbable but that, there's, there's another, that it could be another ship. So that was a big relief. Um, and then getting it out there. Uh, and then the second book, which is um, really goes through all the details uh, of, because a lot of the ship uh, was not standard, as we know, um, nothing was pre-made. And so even all the dovetails are, are made to fit each other. They're not the same size. And mm -hmm. uh, so getting all that out there and, the, and then working the design, I got, you know, I got, I got an award for that because uh, nobody had ever done that sort of thing before and, and determined that. Um, and the award came with a nice check, by the way. <laughs> that was good. Uh, so all of that was is great. And I, I'm just relieved. Uh, I've got other projects on my mind, um, writing an historical novel, which I don't know if I'll ever finish. I've finished my fifth draft of it. Now I'm working on my sixth. Uh, so <laughs> I have plenty to do. And I have a tractor that I like to play on. Dr. Reese, uh, just a question. I don't know if you read about maybe a couple of years ago, they found this bones of a ship on short sands in York. Yes. And um, I really haven't heard too much more about it or anybody did any kind of archeological uh, digging or anything else. Do you know anything about that? You know, I, I did. Um, I, I wasn't, um, Stefan Clausen is an archeologist. Uh, I call him a young archeologist cause he's not 73 like I am. Uh, and uh, he, uh, He's very good and he checked it out and, and did a report on it. And uh, I don't remember his conclusions, but I remember reading it. So I'm sorry to tell you, I don't remember, but, but a good archeologist has looked at it and reported it in, you know, and, and drew it up and everything and sent that into the state. Yeah. Right, thank you. Where would you look to get information on that? The main state archives or? Um, Check with the Maine Historic Preservation Commission, okay. MHPC. Um, they archive all that information and they are very good about giving out information that they can and hiding information that the public shouldn't have because there's always somebody out there who's going to go there and take it all apart and take it home. Um, so, but they, I'm sure, you know, this is the kind of thing that everybody's seen, so they'll do that. Also, um, my guess is the local newspaper will have yeah. written something uh, about that in, in detail because they would have been interested in that report. Um, I don't know what the local paper would be for York. York, York, York Weekly. Okay. Yeah. Yes. And I think the ship, it's still there. Yeah. So they have bad tides or some kind of tide that'll pull the sand away and it, and it comes up out of the... Yeah, the, what happens is in the, in the winter, um, the storm waves, um, you know, the waves come in and they, they twirl and, and they kick the sand around. And usually that happens out a bit, uh, you know, maybe 10 feet out. So that's why when you walk into the, off a beach, there's all of a sudden a drop and then you get a little sandbar. In the winter, that the storms bring that in, so it uncovers things that at, that you will see at low tide. Um, and then 
after the winter in the spring, um, since it's more calm, that sand comes back, drifts back in. So what happens is uh, on these beach wrecks, you'll see them at, in the winter, usually at low tide. Thank you. Well. I'm, I'm interested, I, I don't wanna keep asking questions, but it's so fascinating to me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't wanna take up if somebody else has a question, but um, uh, my undergraduate work is in history too. And when I hear that they just dug up the rest of the ship and threw it away, it, it, you know, it, that must kill you guys as you're standing there watching that happen. And, and my question is, how often does that happen in an archaeological dig? Is that common? I mean, is that happening or? That's the way of things um, when there's going to be construction, yes, a road or um, a building. And, uh, you know, they're required in most uh, states um, and most cities <clears throat> to do the archaeology. By the way, that's a fairly new thing in the United States. We're about the last country in the world to put laws in in the late 70s and early 80s. Um, you know, Turkey started, the country of Turkey started laws like that 300 and something years ago right. um, to protect these sites. But uh, yeah, you know, so they're required to study them. And then what happens to the timbers? In the World Trade Center site, uh, which we did 10 years ago, those timbers are being um, conserved down at Texas A&M University, which has a huge lab for that. And then those will end up at the State Museum in Albany. But that's uncommon. Uh, it's so expensive when you think about it. And I, I'm not, I'd rather see the money spent to protect them and, and to um, save them. But um, to, to do something like that, let's say in Maine, there's a Revolutionary War privateer called Defense. Um, and we excavated that in the 70s. I was just a grad student. I wasn't the director of that. And uh, we studied it carefully, took the artifacts, were all at the Maine State Museum, all been conserved. But the ship timbers, there was no way the state of Maine could raise the money to preserve them. And then to house them, you'd need a building that's or a room that's over 100 feet long, probably 50 feet wide and 20 feet high. And uh, as I said, they, you know, had to have environmental controls for eternity, plus maybe one person on average to salary to take care of it. And today's money, it's you know, a few billion, few billion dollars. And, um, it's hard to convince people that that's where the money should be spent when there's so many other good reasons, uh, good things to protect people and um, health and other services. It's something you live with, you learn, you know, and, yeah. in this business early on, that's the way things are going to happen. And you do the best you can. Wow. Sorry, it was a long answer, but that's, that's the full story. Quite <laughs> right, all right. Would anyone else like to know anything from Dr. Reese? I see yes, Martin's there and Martin, but you you have Marsha's name in front of you. That's that's Martin. Oh. I mean. <laughs> Marsha's his wife. Sorry. Yeah, she started the call and I, I picked it up. Uh, okay. Well, we do have a copy of your book at the library. I can't wait to read it. Um, I would love to have you back when you finish your historical novel. Yeah. Another favorite genre of mine. <laughs> so thank you everybody for coming and um, tuning in and keep track of what's happening at the library. April, we have some real fun events um, coming up, one on recycling. That should be very um, helpful and interesting and, again, fits into another passion of mine, the environment. So um, thank you, Dr. Reese. This was fascinating. I, 
I really do. And I say this um, sincerely. I can't wait to read your book. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So thanks very much for coming. You're welcome. And um, this will be sh this will be recorded and, and played on our website. So uh, I know there are many people that just aren't interested in or able to do Zoom. So they're looking forward to seeing it on the website too. So, and also with BCTV. Is this gonna be archived, Sharon? Yes, it'll be on our, our, our website and it'll be on BCTV website too. Thank you very much, Terry Wright, for helping us through this. And um, as always, a great partner in our programming. You're very welcome. All right, give me just a minute to shut everything down and stop your stream.